podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Tostitos, the official chip and dip of the NFL. If you love the Cowboys, Patriots, Packers, Rams, or the Steelers, Tostitos has the perfect thing to help spice up game day. Their chip and dip bundles come with Tostitos Medium Chunky Salsa, Tostitos Salsa Con Queso, and three Tostitos team bags. And you can get it no matter where you live, but they're only available for a limited time while supplies last. So hurry and buy your bundle today at snacks.com. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. Leaving out the avocado in your salad to save money is not good for morale or your fiber intake. Luckily, State Farm knows the value of the little things. It's why they've got options like insuring your home and ride with surprisingly great rates on both. Because you shouldn't have to give up what you love for great insurance. For surprisingly great rates, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Right, so when we looked at the fixtures, we knew it was going to be a big, important September. But so far, we've got zero points. We've conceded six goals in two second-half collapses. So I'm joined by Tom Newton for the 1865 match report the morning after Forrest lost to Fulham at the city grounds. Um, we lined up with some changes um, following the defeat against Bournemouth. Um, Steve Cooper's had almost two weeks with the players, and he opted to put um, Bolly in defence, Remo Freuler in the middle, and Taiwo Awanyi up front. So we started with Henderson, a back three of Bolly, Cook and McKenna. We had Williams, Yates, Freuler and Roddy in midfield, with Morgan Gibbs-White behind Awanyi and Johnson. And we started pretty brightly with um, Gibbs-White's corner getting flicked on by Yates for Awanyi to head home. But the rest of the half, we barely saw the ball because our defence um, just kept pulling out. We started the second half even better, making a couple of chances before Fulham then scored unmarked from a corner. And then our now familiar collapse followed with Paulinho in space to score from about 20 yards out. And then Harrison Reed was picked out to make it three. For a change of shape and substitute O'Brien pulled one back. And for a time, we were actually the better team. But Fulham shut us out at the end and they took all three points. So at one point in the first half, I checked the stats and Fulham had made 119 attacking passes to our 14. And that pretty much sums up the first half, doesn't it, Tom? Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> Apart from the goal, Fulham were the better side and it was just a matter of time. It was like Forrest was hanging on. Every time they come forward, it was just hanging on. They had a corner, you're thinking, just get out, get this period out of the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, no, it just, they just kept coming and coming. You just couldn't see a way out uh, for Forrest and uh, thankfully we got in at half time 1-0 up but after that like Brett Speller as you said in the second half it was all Fulham for a bit and that basically um, won them the game I mean, in the first half I thought that there was part I mean we kept our shape really really well and although was, what I noticed was we, we were really really compact so we had like the back three and then Freuder and Yates in front of them and there was very little dis- distance between them which meant that Fulham found it very difficult to get through, but we couldn't really do anything when we got the ball, which was quite rare in itself. But when when we did, we we just gave it back to him. Yeah, I mean, in the Premier League, you've got to have more care of the ball, and we ultimately didn't. I mean, Johnson and Gibbs White, they're like, I think they're like a pass off from creating a decent move or something like that. But then the ball just comes straight back, and the back well, the back five. Oh, the three cent halves are just playing overtime in terms of um, trying to keep us out, uh, trying to keep the opponents out, and it's only a matter of time before the um, they get the goal. You see, so it's, it's it is a bit worrying that we just can't keep the ball um, in the attacking half um, for a long period of time. And I think um, I'm, I'm guessing that's kind of why Foyler was brought in was just so that we could actually keep hold of it a little bit better, but. I didn't think he was bad, but I didn't think he, he he didn't make a difference really, did he? No, he didn't. There was there was a spell where I thought, oh, he's getting into the game. Then as soon as I said that, he scored the the first goal, the second goal, and the third goal, and then ultimately he brought off soon after for Lewis O'Brien, who for whatever reason he's been on the bench for the last few games, and like he's been our best player, and it and it tells you something, doesn't it? He comes on in the 70th minute. He plays 26 minutes. He scores a goal and he's man of the match. Yeah. <laughs> that tells you everything. 
And he's got to be an absolute shoe in. He should be the first name on the team sheet uh, after Henderson. And I just don't get it. So um, there's a couple of things you mentioned there that I'd like to touch on. So first of all, it's Gibbs, White and Johnson. There was at least four or five little moments where, like, Gibbs, White picked out Jono, but he was just like half a second too late in put, pulling the pass or or Jono was just like half a yard beyond the defender or something. And they would have been amazing if they'd come off, but they just weren't quite on the same wavelength. Did you notice that? Um, I did. And it's just a case of the whole side at the moment just not gelling and just like lacking that half well that split second of yeah. releasing the ball um etc so i think it's the same with everybody but in an attacking sense where we need goals that's been highlighted more like just that hesitation on a pass or hesitation on a run and it's just not coming off mm. um and you're not going to get many chances in the premier league and there was a couple of chances in especially a one in the second half with that header at the trend end you've got to take those chances yeah, um, but um, I mean, it was we're still a work in progress. But I set, my tweet last night was basically saying I'm not advocating for one minute that I want Steve Cooper out the door. But what Maranakis will see is Forest second from bottom in the league. Ultimately, they could be bottom of the league if Leicester somehow get a win against Spurs later today. And he's going to look at that 150 million he's left his account and Forrest are on the arse end of the Premier League. So he will be looking for some return on that. And the games, what we've had, we looked at the fixture list and we knew Spurs was going to be a difficult game. Man City was a difficult game. But when you got into the September, you think, oh, we're playing Fulham, Bournemouth, Leeds until it got postponed. We've got Villa coming up and Leicester. Well, two of those games have already gone and we've got no points, and we've conceded six goals at home from winning positions. I'm sorry, but that that is not good enough right, if you want to stay in this league. Twenty minutes and all. That's that's the other thing. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know what the goal difference is, but obviously we're not. It's the old adage, isn't it? I mean, when we even when we was in the Premier League in the nineties and ultimately struggling, BBC match of the day used to say Forest can't score goals or defend, mm-hmm. and ultimately we went down on these uh, in the seasons of. Um, 93, um, 97 and 99. And the same thing's happening now. We're not scoring enough goals and we're conceding too many. And I mean, oh, I would played Spurs the other week and um, it was Harry Kane who was the difference. And I thought we played pretty well in that. But Fulham and Bournemouth from winning positions and six goals in, like you say, 20 minutes, that is, that's poor. That's, that's poor. Because people are saying, oh, we need to have a bit of perspective of like, We've signed 22 players. We've done this, we've done that. We know all the stories and everything. But still, if you can't beat... No disrespect to Fulham and Bournemouth, but if you cannot beat those sides, where are the wins going to come from? Yeah. Because um, after we've got... I mean, Villa won last night against Southampton and they're going to... They might pick up now. Leicester is still bottom of the league, but after that we've got... And we away. just know that if there's a game when Liverpool. Leicester going to turn it round, it's going to be against us. Yeah, exactly. So then, then where do we go? Um, it's just I know Steve Cooper's got he's basically got a brand new squad and he's got to gel them, and but we're still making the same mistakes, and that's the most frustrating factor of this. I mean, he's had what two weeks since the Bournemouth game, near enough, and it's still the same. We're still making the same mistakes, and tactically, I, I'm not, never going to like say I'm some master tactician, but. The three centre halves. It might work in the championship. It is not working now. Um, we need to probably go. Well, we need to go four at the back or put some extra in midfield because we're just getting overrun in midfield. And well, it wasn't I, on to. I want to touch on that because again, this comes back to to Freuler a bit. You said a, a little while ago that um, that you thought, oh, Freuler's just getting into the game, and then they went and scored. Mm-hmm. So from what, where I was sitting, it looked to me like um, I can remember looking up at one point in the second half. And we had three lines. We had like back five, all in a straight line. Then we had two, and then we had three in front of them, and again all in a straight line. And it was just, it just left these massive spaces in between each line. And I think what was happening was, and this is what Bournemouth did to us as well, was they were pinning our fullbacks right back, and that meant Freuder and Yates 
the only way we could actually do anything with the ball was to come for those two to come forwards, and then that left that gap that that um, the uh, what's his face, um, Paulinho just stepped into to to score that that twenty yard goal again. Like, again, like Bournemouth when um, what's his name Billing had had a twenty yard shot. It was he just had acres of space to pick and choose where he wanted to put it. And and yeah. that's kind of what's happening. And and because we're playing that back five, the back three, as soon as our wing backs get pinned back, we, we haven't got any way to do anything with the ball. Exactly. And when the wing backs are being pinned back and the players in the middle, they are absolutely not influencing the game at all. Mm-hmm. So if there's like Froilo and Yates in there or whoever, and they just put an extra man in there, just, the maps tell you that. They're just, yeah. just going to pass around. It's like, it's it's basic, but... I think Steve Cooper's just got to... I mean, it's worked so well for him, that formation, but it's not working in the Premier League. Um, we need to get that extra man in midfield and because that's where um, games have won, been won and lost in the um, previous weeks uh, for, um, well, obviously the teams what we've uh, played against um, for them winning the game and us losing the game is that we're not winning that midfield battle. And another thing is with Yates, I mean, you might get away with it in like at League One or Championship level, but you can't keep going around ploughing into uh, players. I mean, the slightest touch, the players are clever in the Premier League, slightest touch you down and the amount of free kicks we gave away when he could have like been a bit cute, he could have dropped a shoulder, just got in front of the man, and we, he might have won the ball. No, you can't keep ploughing through. That frustrated if, me if, last if night. Players got his back to you. Yeah. You don't put your hands on him <laughs> because he's exactly, a... yeah. Even with a fingertip, he's going to go over. And I didn't think the referee was great last night, but I'm not for one minute going to say he was the cause of us losing that game last night. We was just na- we was naive with the ball and naive without the ball. And another thing on that corner, when it when his space had ever scored a goal, yeah. <laughs> and what's this zonal marking? You know what I mean? Just. Man mark, get a man on the post. And, but he's obviously run into the space. He's headed the ball into the bottom corner. Nobody's on the post. And it's 1-1. One, one. As well. It was, yeah. yeah. I mean, just before that, everybody was like cheering because, I mean, Mitrovic, it was a, he was a pain in the arse last night. <laughs> he really was. But everybody was he's like, for that split second, he got blocked off. And he's like, hey, nobody was getting... I can't remember who it was. Diop was. Was it Diop or is it the other guy? Who scored the goal last night? I can't. Um, the, the one with the long name. See. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No disrespect to him. But he's, he's scored. It's like everybody's cheering, like we've sorted out the danger man, but nobody's picking up the pieces on the back yeah. post. And again, um, that's like the, the, thing, the, the one against Bournemouth when Yates was off the pitch. Someone should have been saying, right, who's doing Yates' job covering that bit exactly. on, that, on that area? It only needs a man. I mean, if you're not the biggest, just put him off. Yeah. And we, we just didn't do that then. The second goal come and the third goal come. And it wasn't until we went back, brought Warrell on, went back to back four and got O'Brien on the pitch. We looked a better side, but I just don't get why we're not playing Lewis O'Brien when he's been the shining light in our midfield this season. He's been brilliant, but he's been benched for the last three games or whatever it is. Uh, well, so, I, just, mean, I just don't get it. it. Just, just to sort of talk about that a little bit. So, yeah, well, obviously, when O'Brien and Morrill came on, we changed shape to a what was basically a four-two-three-one, um, and then Emmanuel Dennis came on a bit later, and we ended up with Gibbs White at left back, which um, surprised me a little bit. Um, but and that was more to keep the shape more than anything, yeah. but it's a bit of a strange, uh, strange mood. But um, yeah, so O'Brien coming on, he just gave us loads and loads of energy in the middle, and. He could, he could pass the ball, he could drive it forwards, he could run with it, he could tackle. He, he was doing all the things that that Yates yeah. and Freuler together weren't doing. Yeah, and that was in a 26-minute spell. It's just, yeah, it just baffled me why he's not been um, playing. But uh, I, thought, I thought we looked a bit better with a striker up there, but as soon as I want to come off and brought Surridge on, I mean, no disrespect to Surridge, but He's not going to keep the ball up there, is he? No, when no. you've got those two centre halves, I, I thought I would have liked I wanted to stay on with Surridge next to him, uh, but obviously that didn't happen. And but no, ultimately it was such a frustrating, um, frustrating night last night, and um, questions are going to be start being asked about um, Steve Cooper's 
uh, tactical um, selections and uh, and obviously the team what he's ultimately putting out uh, at the moment. Well, I mean, I, I will say this: um, unlike Bournemouth, so uh, Bournemouth, like we just knew that they were going to win all the way through the second half, and there was no way we were going to get back into it. Whereas yesterday, I did suspect there was a good chance that until. Fulham in the 87th minute or something decided to just shut the game down with loads and loads of niggly fouls and and, and stuff like that. But until then, once O'Brien was on, we did look like there was a good chance we could pull something back, which is a much better situation to be in than Bournemouth. But ultimately, it's still zero points and three goals conceded. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's annoying, isn't it, when you're looking at him thinking, why couldn't we play like this? At the start of the second half, yeah. and we have to leave it until we're like three one down to pull a goal back, and then look like we might be doing something. But um, no, it's, like I said, it's just a really frustrating night, and it's another home defeat against a fellow promoted side. So um, yeah, we need to book our ideas up if we're going to stay in this um, league. I know there's a lot of games still uh, to be had, but if. Like I say, if you look at your, your games in September and we, well, we're coming to the back end of the month and we've got no points, it's not good. It's not good. The 1865 Match Report. This episode is brought to you by Samsung. Unfold the all-new Galaxy Z Fold 4 and expand your world. With Flex Mode, it stands on its own, so you're hands-free to get more done during calls. And with multi-window view, you can use up to three apps at the same time. Plus, the edge-to-edge screen allows you to fully immerse yourself in your favorite games and shows. Visit Samsung.com to learn more about Galaxy Z Fold 4. So it's pretty bad, all in all. Um, I mean, the first half showed that we can do it defensively. And the second half, the, the end of the second half, showed that we've got the drive and whatever to... to to take the game to, to the opponents if we need to, but we can't seem to do it over 90 minutes. Um, where do you think that is? Is Do you think that's the the fact that we're playing the wrong shape? Have we got the wrong players? Does Cooper not know the side? Or is it down to him and the decisions that he's making? Uh, I think it's all of those things. And on, another thing on top of that, uh, lack of concentration. you, you got to be on it for 90, 90 Two ninety-four minutes in this league, and last night I thought Bolly started the game okay, but as soon as the game ebbed away, he was like in no man's land for oh on some occasions, and yeah, it was like, why, why are you there? Making tackles on the halfway line, yeah, like, and it's you're like supposed to be the centre half as part of the back three. Yeah, it's just like you're not. The, at the end of the day, the the back the back four and probably some. Personal in midfield are not being disciplined enough, and the reason they're not being disciplined enough, and then they're just getting picked apart, and then ultimately we're conceding goals. It's like the goal last night from Harrison Reed. It's just he's there in eight because he's, and he's just smashed it past Henderson. It's like, well, where's Loddy? He's mm. not there. Where, where's I don't know who the nearest one to him, but everybody's got drawn towards the ball, and the same thing happened against Man City. Um, three players were drawn towards Phil Foden, but. The most dangerous man in world <laughs> football at the moment, Erling Haaland. Now we'll leave him, and he's got a simple tap in. And same again, everybody gets drawn towards the ball. Harrison's on, uh, obviously, when the on the back post near enough, or outside the area, or wherever he was. And he's he can pick his spot, and it's just naive defending. And we've got to get away from this naivety because the worst thing what could happen in, in the coming weeks, we could get there could be a, like a huge difference in terms of where we are. And where the next team is in terms of points, if you get um, that quarter drift, it's a lot to make up in the Premier League, in, in any league really, but especially Premier League where it's absolutely brutal um, in terms of you give teams a ch- um, half a chance, they're going to stick it away. And I think that the worrying thing from is that we're, we're not actually that far away from the World Cup. That's going to be six weeks pretty much without a game. So if we're adrift, if there's a gap opened up, and then we've got six weeks off. Coming back to, to that situation is going to be really, really difficult. Yeah. 
Um, when we do come back, two games what we come back to are not easy. We've got um, Man United on Boxing Day, then a couple of days later we've got Chelsea at home, which I know they've changed personnel in terms of Tuchel being given the, the chop and Potter coming in, but Chelsea are Chelsea, aren't they? And they've still got world-class players. And Man United seem to be turning the corner now after that sticky uh, start of the season. So that's obviously not going to be an easy game. Um, and I'm not for one minute saying there's any easy games in the, in the Premier League, but we've got to start booking our ideas up now because uh, Maranakis wants to see a return on this investment. And we cannot, for what he's put, put in, he does not want to see Forrest in that bottom three. He's probably had aspirations, probably a mid-table finish, and we're far from it now at the moment, I should say. Well, I mean, this is that this is another good point. So you've mentioned it already, I think. Or whatever. I can't, can't remember if you mentioned it when we were recording, but we'll come to that definitely. Certainly when I was walking out the ground, I overheard at least three people saying, well, the owner's going to, going to get rid of him because um, I bet he's, he's opening his phone book now ringing around um, you mentioned Thomas Tuchel I know there's circumstances at Chelsea but it's it's not too early to sack a manager so, do you think he's in trouble? Uh, yes I do it's just it's just the how Maranakis operates at the end of the day I mean people would be like saying oh yeah you didn't got time and this that and the other but the big factor here is 150 million pounds wasn't in the conversation and when you've I know he's got 22 players and he's going to knit them together and, and gel and everything but ultimately what Maranakis is going to be seeing is a bank balance which is 150 million light and he's seen Forrest second from bottom yeah. and with was it four uh, defeats on the spin now? And we we knew it was going to be tough. There's no getting away. It was going to be tough. But, and I mean, on a different day, circumstances might have changed for us. We might have, like, held on for the win at Everton. We might have um, um, beaten Bournemouth at home on another day. We could have beat, um, beaten Fulham last night. But, at the end of the day, we haven't, and this is where we are. And um, Maranakis, we're like, we, I'm not advocating for one minute Steve Cooper to be given the trap because for everything he's done for every Forest fan out there, we cannot thank him enough. But people will know that this is a results driven business. And when the 150 million has been invested, I mean, if we was a, no despair, but if we was a Bournemouth and no money's been spent, you can obviously cut him some slack. But 150 million, it's it's a lot. It's a big outlay that is, and to be what second from bottom and four defeats on the spin. Two it of them were interesting. The atmosphere where where I was sat as well. But there was a lot of people saying exactly that. I don't advocate him going, but the owner is ruthless. The owner is very very ruthless, and. It's it's a, it's an interesting take on it because yeah normally we you, you get the, the the forest fans our history of changing man, man, managers the fans are very very polarized on it it's like oh well he's got to go or we need to give the manager time whereas this situation just feels completely different it does because I know we're in a different league and we're not in like the quagmire of the championship but. You just can see what may happen in the coming weeks if this situation doesn't improve. And like I said, we love Steve Cooper to bits, but he will know it's a results-driven business. And if he's not delivering results, then unfortunately the manager pays the price. And as a, as a um, bit of just something I just thought of, which is complete speculation and out of the air, but... You can look back at last se- uh, no, the season before when Tuchel took over at Chelsea and he took a team that wasn't gelling, that wasn't firing on all cylinders, got them playing with a back five and got them immediate results. And you're thinking Maranakis is probably looking at that and saying, actually, managers can do that. It is possible. Yeah. I mean, Steve Cooper did it last year, didn't he? Yeah. He was, um, what, one point from seven games he come in and absolutely transform the um, the club but uh, I think he's I think first and foremost he's got to help himself he's got to 
get to a point where he's got. To, I know we all think we're managers, and ultimately we're not because we're just Joe Plucks in the crowd. But Steve Cooper's got to start picking the side what you look at and thinking that's a decent side. That's the side I would put, and. I think we're getting torn to shreds in midfield. O'Brien has to start next game. Has to. If he doesn't, something's drastically wrong in why he's not playing. Um, I, I like Yates' enthusiasm and wears his heart on his sleeve and, and everything, but I just think he's lacking that quality in midfield. There's a couple of times yesterday where it's a yeah, and he has to play like a pass out to the wing to uh, Nico Williams, and there's not enough on it. It gets cut out. Nico Williams is out the picture because he's obviously bombed forward. The midfield's then got to turn back and face in their own goal, and we're getting outnumbered. And that happened a couple of times um, yesterday. And and another thing is what I mentioned earlier is what frustrating me is you got to be a bit cuter in the Premier League, and I think there's a lot of players out there who are naive. Um, in terms of trying to get the ball back, there was a couple of times yesterday that Yates just ploughed through the back of somebody and it's like, you can't do that. You might get away with it in the Championship, but you cannot get away with it um, now in the Premier League. So we need to wise up. We need to same get a bit... For Freuler, Freuler sort of thought he had more time to do stuff with the ball yeah. than, than he actually did. Yeah. But we've got to get a bit more streetwise so, because that's... That like bit of now of what to do in the Premier League. I think it's. I know we haven't got a lot of Premier League experience in there, but we've played quite a few games now. You know what the Premier League's about, and we need to yeah. wise up because we're going to get um, cashed adrift. So it's the international break coming up. So another um, little period without without any games. Um, that could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. Obviously, we've got a, few, a lot more internationals with us than we did last season. Um, but then for, after that, we've got Leicester, then Villa, and then Wolves. And they definitely become um, games we can't afford to drop any points at all, I think. Exactly. I mean, that Leicester, I mean, they've started the season <laughs> worse than us, to be honest. But, um, I mean, they've got Spurs later today. and I can't see... Uh, Spurs losing that one so yeah that game um, oh, I've got King Power Stadium I think it's going to be a huge game and we need to come away there if we don't and it might turn their season into Leicester if they beat us and hopefully we want that win to kickstart our season but yeah the next uh, two games are, are huge and I mean Wolves haven't been pulling up any trees this season so that's another important game then we've got Liverpool at home on the 22nd yeah. so yeah <laughs> So uh, let's hope Steve Cooper can um, can make it happen. So um, thanks for that, Tom, um, and thank you for listening to us. Uh, we'll be back again after the international break with a match report um, from the Leicester game. Podcast Network. Here's the lowdown on lowering bad cholesterol from Lecvio. Lowering bad cholesterol is hard, but you could do hard. You live through five fad diets, 11 sleep training nights, nine mediocre middle school recitals, one heart attack. And with Lecvio, you can lower your bad cholesterol and keep it low with two doses a year after two starter doses. Prescription Lecvio in glycerin is given by a doctor for people with known heart disease on a statin with diet who need more help lowering bad cholesterol. Common side effects were injection site reaction, joint pain, urinary tract infection, diarrhea, chest cold, pain in legs or arms, and shortness of breath. Results may vary. Learn more at Lecvio.com. Or call 1-833-537-8462. Ask your doctor about Lecvio. That's L-E-Q-V-I-O. Lower, longer, Lecvio.